Hi everyone, we have a super special video today because uh, we have Hassan on. Hassan is a personal friend of mine as well of a as well as a client of ours at AI Hello. And today we're going to be speaking about his story, you know, starting out on Amazon super early and scaling up his rent to multiple eight figures per year. Uh, it's pretty interesting. I haven't heard the the whole thing myself, so I'm pretty interested as well to figure out, you know, how he got to where he is. So Hassan, how about you just give like a quick intro about yourself to the people watching? Hi. So, uh... Good evening, good morning, wherever you guys are. Uh, thank you, Seth, for having me on your podcast. And this is actually my first time I'm doing any podcast. So my story is very interesting, and I'll try to keep it brief uh, for many people. I, I came to States for my higher education, like many people do, from Pakistan back in 1990. I did my master's here and then I went back to Pakistan and then I was working there in corporate for almost uh, seven years. Uh, my first job was with one of the largest uh, groups in Pakistan that was inspiring to be a leading internet service provider back in Pakistan. Back then it was in AOL days and you know email was very basic. So I was hired to lead the marketing uh, for that internet startup. And the company was called Cybernet. To date, it is in Pakistan. And in fact, it, they are the largest uh, internet service provider today across Pakistan. They, they went from dial-up when I was there to, to fiber optics now. And, and the company is called Storm Fiber. So I, I had a very early dip on the tech side and on the e-commerce side and understanding the internet space and obviously being part of an internet service provider, you know, I was uh, abreast of a lot of technologies, what was really happening. But then in 2001, uh, a very different opportunity came along uh, because my family is from construction side and construction background and engineering background. And back then uh, in San Francisco Bay Area, there was a very big push for seismic retrofit jobs for the major bridges. So I set up a startup company to provide some of the offshore engineering services uh, to the contractors over here. And I was honored to be able to work on some of the largest seismic retrofit jobs ever undertaken in the civil engineering history, including the famous Bay Bridge, Golden Gate Bridge, uh, Richmond Center Rafael Bridge, and we were we participated in that in those multi-billion dollar projects, and we were providing offshore uh, CAD engineering services to the contractors. But meanwhile, you know, nine one one had happened, and I was still going on with the contract. I had a staff of almost one hundred and fifty engineers in Pakistan, and about eight nine over here, and. Uh, there were certain laws passed and, you know, it became very difficult to procure future work. So I had to make a decision what to do. And as I was winding down that particular operation, you know, we had bought a house here uh, and uh, my daughter was born, my second child. And uh, my wife was, and I was thinking what to do. I had two options, do something here or go back to Pakistan. And she want, she want, she came to me, and this is absolutely a true story without any, any exaggeration. She came to me and she said, I have a window here and I want to buy two curtains. I want to buy these four curtains from Pottery Barn. And my mood was really bad and I was stressed out with, because, you know, uh, I was bleeding money and all that. I said, you know what? And, I, she, and then she, at that point, she handed me over a Pottery Barn magazine and, and she wanted to buy velvet curtains from Pottery Barn. And back then they were like $119 each and she wanted to buy six or eight of them, whatever it was. And uh, I told them, I said, you know what? Why do you want to spend so much money on these curtains? Why don't you just go and make yourself and, and do something with it? And I threw the magazine back at her and, and we had a fight and, you know. Long story short, moving forward, maybe a couple of months passed. We did not, we never, we never bought the curtains. You know, a small box came to my house. And I opened the box. It was a DHL box, and it had my wife's name on it. And I gave it to her. I said, your box came in. I, I felt like there were some clothes in them. I said, maybe somebody sent it for me. Her, her father had mailed her out. 
And she opened up and she pulled out the drapes and she hung them in the middle. She said, you told me to make them one. I made them in Pakistan and I saved almost 70% of the cost, even with the digital fees. And they were beautiful and they were hung. Then, you know, she made me a cup of tea and she says, you know, uh, can I do this? Can I sell the curtains? Can you help me? I said, how the hell do you want me to help you? I mean, uh, curtains, I mean, are you crazy? I'm doing engineering work on Bay Bridge and Golden Gate Bridge and all that stuff. And uh, long story short, I, I never took it seriously. But maybe another four weeks passed and then there was a big box came on me. And now I opened up and there were like a bunch of these velvet curtains in there. And it hung there. I said, well, you did, did you order more curtains? She said, no, no, I just want to see if I can sell them. And you will help me. I said, where do you want me to sell them? Where do I go? I mean, they are curtains. I, I, I don't know. I don't know anything. I, I have no idea what to do with it. So I threw them in the garage, Seth. And they actually ended there for almost four to five weeks before she begged me to help her out. And at that point, the only platform that I was actively engaged with, because I love to use cars, and I, I, I always have one car, a project car that I buy, and you know, I, then I buy parts, and this, I was very active on eBay. So that's the only platform that I actually had knowledge of how it operates. So I physically said, okay, you know what? I went on eBay, I found a bunch of people selling a bunch of curtains, and a lot of them were selling used items or they had bought in and lightly used, and there were a bunch of pottery barn and restoration hardware curtains and all of that. So I quickly glanced at them, you know, and then I took the pictures of those on my windows myself. I, I, I'm, I'm an avid photographer, so I always have my cameras and all that. So I did that, and I created a listing, and there were seven pairs of drapes, and that's an absolute true story. This is March of 2005. There were 14 drapes, seven pair of curtains, seven pairs, I hung them up. They were in two colors. One was Java, I still remember, and one was like a golden tan brown color. So there were three of those and four of those. I made a listing. I put it up, whatever I, I could, you know, grab it up, and I put them up, and I put them up as buy now. And uh, and I put them up buy now. I think back then in eBay, you can set up the dates, like a three-day or auction or a seven-day auction. I put them at seven-day auction. And... Nothing was happening. I could see the watchers coming in, and I didn't even pay attention to it. Right on the seventh day, I think the bid was supposed. I think the listing was supposed to expire around six thirty p.m. You know, I, I log in and I saw this email popped up. You made a sale. eBay sold. eBay sold. eBay sold. And they all sold out because I had priced them at the half the price of everybody else, actually, and. And still making a good margin on them, and they all got sold out. And the from, and I was so happy they sold out. I said, "Thank God, this nonsense is over." I said, "Your money's in the PayPal. I'll give it to you, and I'm done with it." You know, behold, after a month, a couple of more boxes shows up. So that's where the name of Half Price Drapes was born. That's how the story started. I started on eBay, and uh, after maybe eighth or ninth run, you know, I felt there is something and I was already looking to do something else. I had a little bit of money saved up. I was winding down my engineering operations and uh, I just took a leap of faith. I said, you know what? Maybe there is something to it. And that's where the story starts. And it's been almost 19 years now. And uh, from eBay, it was a Yahoo store. And then I got into it. I educated myself in fabrics. I went to Pakistan. I spent a couple of months at my friend Mills in learning how the fabric is woven, how it's dyed, how it is stitched. And then I, you know, I still have a house there. So I stayed there. I made a small shop to make some custom curtains. And then I put them on Yahoo store. I had a friend of, in my very good friend was in India and in Bangalore. He helped me out, get things up. And that's where the high price tape story was on. And then I think end of 2006, I opened my first warehouse in Livermore, California. And uh, it's been 19 years. Yeah, no, that makes, that makes sense. That's a very interesting story. I know the background on that. How did these two platforms perform for you back then? Like what was 2005 eBay like? And what was like Yahoo store? Like, like, did you get any serious? Yahoo work? was, I think Yahoo was the only uh, major platform in terms of e-commerce. So I think Yahoo was 
2006's Shopify store. So if you wanted to open up your, you know, your your uh, e-commerce website, the easiest way to was to sign up for Yahoo store for twenty nine ninety nine, and you can get your Yahoo store. You can make your listings, and you can go from there. And uh, eBay was the major uh, marketplace back then. I, I, I think Amazon was still coming along, uh, but it was more books and you know novelty items and stuff like that. Amazon really had not morphed into what obviously is one of the greatest success stories of all time. And uh, Yahoo Store was really simple. I, I, I think the team back then in Yahoo uh, was amazing what they, they developed back then in terms of deployment ease and, and its simple capabilities and able to make your store and, and keep it updated and inventory feeds and you could connect eBay and you can connect a few other stuff and you can do a lot of good stuff. The ICO was great. So back then, you know, as soon as I launched Yahoo Store, uh, our metrics started to shift, you know, from eBay being 100% of the sales for the first maybe year started to go around to 70% and, you know, and then it started to go back up a lot because I, my margins were better on Yahoo and I, I just liked the way, you know, I could present my products. You know, I started to find photographers, started to present it, you know, a lot better, having more and more products. So Yahoo, I think, was a fantastic platform. I, th I think they missed the biggest opportunity. I mean, had they done their, had they had the right vision, I think Shopify should not have been in the business, but such are the stories. Yeah, yeah, no, but that makes sense. I was reading up on this, actually. There are a few others, I believe, around that time, and all of them have gone out of business. It's only Shopify and I think there's WooCommerce too, but barely anyone uses it compared to Shopify. Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, there, after that, a lot of people came along, but I, I, I think at some point of time, any business that is still in, is in business from back in 2005s and 6s, I'm pretty sure 80, 70% were on the Yahoo store. And, uh, and the, you know, and that was one of the major e-commerce platform because there was the ease of payment collections and all that stuff. Uh, the accounting was very simple. You could get a flat file out of there. You can dump it into QuickBooks and you can run your books on it. So it was pretty organized and, and they built something great. I mean, it's a, it's a sad story, but, you know, had they they kept it up, I, I think they would be the Shopify of 2024. But uh, that's that's where it was. How did you so I think back then to like the Yahoo store? Was it just like Google? Pardon me? Or everything was super cheap back then? Like track yes. Back then? Absolutely. Social media was hardly existing uh, back then. So it, um, it was uh, advertising on Yahoo itself on the, because I think Yahoo was also one of the most popular, uh, you know, website back then for women to visit. You know, there was a lot of uh, articles and a lot of section for, for females and, and our, our buyers obviously are 95% females. And then we ran the Google ads. I, I think that was the marketing was really simple. You know, Google ad platform was very basic. Uh, you could you could run it. You can curate your you know your keywords and you can do your analysis, and and I managed all of it myself. And it it, it was it was real simple. Um, Yahoo advertising platform was actually very good. Yahoo had a very good shopping feed, and then there was a platform back then which was called Shopping.com. So basically, what Google Shopping today is, uh, I think it might still exist. I haven't logged into that. Shopping.com used to be that site where people will upload their feeds. And then you can put your coupons and your pricing and it will link to your Yahoo store. So I was very, very active on shopping.com and Yahoo and Google. And that was the entire uh, marketing suite in terms of the paid marketing. And then in terms of organic marketing, I started to write my articles and, and you know, reach out to the editors of major magazines. You know, we were covered in New York Times back in 2009. That was a very interesting story. And then there was, uh, there are a few other magazines, Beautiful Home and Home and Garden magazine. And then I got into a uh, kind of a relationship with the IG, you know, TV back then it was coming along. And then I, you know, so it was just those basic old school marketing activities, you know, old school PR, printed ads and local. And my focus was a lot more on custom back then because our inventory used to be very small and we were still actively selling on eBay. And right after that point, you know, we, we did get into other platforms. Uh, one of the major platforms in 2010, 11, you know, was Overstock came up, you know, they came along and Overstock exploded basically uh, as, as, a, as a portal for home goods. And 
uh, they approached me and uh, I jumped on the gun under our corporate brand, Exclusive Fabrics. And we became a very large partner with Overstock for many, many years. Interestingly, Wayfair back then was CSN stores. So they had this bunch of 100, 500 websites. So you had to pick up one which you want to be on. And uh, then one day I got a call from somebody in Wayfair. They said, we are having a conference and you have been selected if you want to come over. So I went there and then that was when they announced that they're going to have one website called Wayfair.com. This is before Wayfair. It was CSN store. So they wanted to select vendors and then, you know, we became part of the Wayfair and then Wayfair took off and uh, and for many years, Wayfair, Wayfair was our largest partner. They're still a very, very big partner for us and so is Overstock. And then in all of this, you know, I was I always wanted to be on, on, on Amazon. I had a few listings here and there, but I never considered in my poor thinking that anybody would buy curtains on Amazon. Like I, it just never. I said, who's gonna buy curtains on Amazon? I understand Wayfair; they're selling home goods. I understand Overstock. I understand my side. So I was very uh, uh, reluctant to expose the complete catalog on on Amazon. It was not till I think 2016, 17, when I I was invited by Amazon in Seattle for a, for a co- for a home furnishing conference. And that's when, you know, I really realized, you know, what I've been missing for a long time and what a strategic mistake we're going to make if we don't get on Amazon. And that's when we fired up the Amazon. For many years, we were a regular Seller Central account with them. Uh, interestingly speaking, we never did FBA. And to date, we don't do FBA. Uh, because very early on, on our success on regular platform, Amazon came to us and they said, you have been chosen to become a vendor central account for us. So do you want to have that partnership? And then I had to choose between FBA or the vendor central. And I, based on simple margin analysis and, and the amount of effort it takes and all of that and logistics, because we had a warehouse in California and we were firing up our new warehouse up in, in Atlanta, Georgia. So we decided that we're going to go with Vendor Central. And to date, we are one of the largest uh, Amazon 1P partner in the space. I think we are the only biggest partner that Amazon has in the 1P space. Everybody else is 3P. You know, we do still have a 3P business on Amazon, but it's really small and we don't market it because under the agreement, most of our ASINs are not allowed to be sold as um, as Seller Central. And then... And then Amazon, you know, over the years have just overtaken everybody. I think they outsell everybody 7 to 1, 10 to 1, 20 to 1. So, you know, so definitely it's it's one of the biggest priorities we have. It's very interesting because I was just going to ask about that. Because obviously today, like if you compare any of these platforms to Amazon, like they're usually producing like 1 to 10% of the volume that you are producing on Amazon. And that's for every brand pretty much that you've spoken to. Uh, how mm-hmm. were these other platforms performing back then? Like when you were on, I know obviously Yahoo wasn't really a platform. It was more of a website builder from my understanding. Uh, but like mm-hmm. in terms of volume back then, like through the Yahoo store, eBay, Overstock and stuff like that, like could you actually bring in a decent sales volume? Was it like early seven figures? Could you still touch eight figures? Like where was it actually? When we started to touch the higher figures, uh, when we broke the $10 million mark, so let's just put, you know, just that's a baseline I will draw. At that point, 45 to 50% was business was still driven through our D2C business, which is our own website, HowPriceTapes.com. And I, I love that metrics because the margins are obviously the best when you're selling yourself. And the rest, uh, 60%, uh, the biggest business driver out of the 60%, you know, was Wayfair. You know, that was almost 45, 50% of the business. And then 20, 25% of the business was overstock and rest was Amazon. And then when we started to get into more deeper relationships with Amazon, then it started to flip everything. Then if you look at today, then Amazon is almost 60% of our total entire business. And then everybody else has become 40%. And that 40%, HPD still is 25% of the business. And, and, And then everybody else share has shrunk considerably uh for for lots of reasons uh you know 
every body has a different niche. Overstock lost their footing. You know, they they lost the leadership. They just they just couldn't figure out what to do with the brand. You know, they wanted to be a home retailer. Then they got into bitcoins, and, and you know, their top management was all over the place. And and you know, they had a great great audience, but I think they they really messed up the their branding and 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 their reach program. And Wayfair actually capitalized on them. Whatever Overstock has lost has gone to Wayfair. Wayfair has done a fantastic job in terms of what they are able to do in terms of the brand and in terms of you know curating their sub brands like Joss and Maine and all of that within the home category so they were able to drive all the business out of out of overstock and they took the majority of the share and not only from the online shares right i think a lot of furniture business a lot of home business uh, uh, you may be too young but you know when i came here you know, every time we used to buy something, you know, it was a weekend wash for me. You know, my wife wants to buy a side table and my weekend was shot because she's going to make me go to eight, nine, seven shops. And, you know, you're driving from here to there. You're finding you're dribbling and dribbling and then you're buying something. And I, I don't remember buying anything in a shop in the last seven, eight years. Yes, we've gone to seen it, but we have done all our research online. So, there was a major shift that happened in the last 12 to 15 years in the home industry where furniture stores are closed, right? I mean, if you look at big stops, like Macy's used to have a huge uh, furniture stores. You know, they have scaled back tremendously. Ashley still is on because it's a price point delivery thing, uh, you know. And, and, and then, you know, all these mom and pop stores, they just went away. And then it was all consolidated in among... I would say three major brands in terms of physical retails. William Sonoma, you know, parent company of Pottery Barn and West Elm, and C, you know, they have a fantastic, uh, you know, presence in store and online. And then you have Restoration Hardware, which has a presence online, but their strategy is to have the worst possible customer experience online. But they want to come, they want to bring you in, and I actually like it because it's the only furniture store where I can go there and don't buy a single piece of furniture and I can still spend $200 because the food is fantastic. So, you know, so it's, so they went into an experience now. Rest, you know, uh, if you remember, there was a store, there was a big chain in the U.S. Uh, called Pier One Imports. It was a massive success and they disappeared. And Pier One was one of those stores where you will go buy your knickknacks, your you know this and that, and, and your cushion covers and your and runners and and table mats and and, and curtains and some small mid furniture, all gone, right? It's all gone to online. And and I think eight or nine years ago, I I, I still remember the pitch that Amazon gave us about ten years ago. The guy said. We don't care about, this is quote and quote, we don't care about we make money, we lose money. We don't want to make money, we can lose money. All I care about is one thing. He said, I want everything that you guys sell on Amazon.com. So they went after everybody to make sure that the entire catalog is present on Amazon. And that was the, that is where they started to take a great hold on the home category when everybody started to put their entire catalog on Amazon. I remember initially I used to have maybe 20 ASINs on, on Amazon or 30. Today I have 6,000 ASINs on Amazon, right? I mean, so it's unbelievable what what really transpired. And similarly with every other merchant, you know, you look at bedding market and you can get down to, I mean, even the socks. I, I don't think I've bought socks outside Amazon for the last eight, nine years. I mean, my you know, my son plays basketball and, and he loves to play basketball in his socks in the backyard, so he rips his socks every week. So the point is, they went after these soft goods very strategically, which are easier to store, easier to ship. Furniture industry, I think Amazon did try for a while and, you know, assembled furniture, and I don't think they had a great success in that because I don't think they the experience you get on Amazon PDPs are not tuned for furniture, I think. Pottery Barn does a much better job, and CB2 does a great job, and a few other people. Uh, but all the soft home goods, I mean, they were able to suck the blood out of everybody. They were able to grab this market. And and not only that, you know, they, they on, on the flip side, 
with their penetration, mm -hmm. with the subscription in 100 million homes, you know, they are the only platform that actually delivers the audience at the rate that you cannot simply get it. You, you cannot spend enough money to drive the traffic to your own website or, or any of the portal that Amazon organically have. I mean, that's just, you know, I don't know the stats, 60% of every search starts on Amazon and it's true. So, you know, they are ingrained in the e-commerce system and uh, what they have built is going to take a lot to be challenged, you know, a rival by anybody else. I think Walmart is trying. Um, it definitely has its niches and I think they will do well. I don't think they will ever become Walmart. I think it's 11% what on their online of, of their versus retail. So, you know, you, you have to, if you want to, if you make something, you want to sell something, you have to be on Amazon. I mean, whether you like it or you hate it, you know, I, there are time I hate it, but it's, 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 uh, it's a husband wife relationship. You've got to live together. Of course. And I had a question for you because you're obviously a lot more successful than the average Amazon seller today. Like most people, because I end up meeting probably 100, 200 sellers a month just because I have so many calls. I think I just finished my 15th call before this recording today. Uh, so I end awesome. up meeting a bunch of people. Most of them are going nowhere. Sometimes you can immediately point like out and like, for example, you got someone who just started on Amazon. They've been selling for five months. They just don't know how to use Seller Central. You can tell they're never actually looking at the reports. Right, and you can tell some people are just not going to make it. But other than mm -hmm. that, like, what's the difference between like someone who makes it to your size and maybe someone who works hard and gets like to a million, half a million, two million, or some of like these smaller and but not necessarily unsuccessful ranges? Right, I, I I can talk about myself, and 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 I I think in general, you know, when I have a principle, I I don't chase a number. Uh, I've never done so. I I never. Uh, you know, it's good to have goals, but if, if you look at Amazon and you from day one, you are focusing that I want to do $2 million, or I want to do a million dollars in sales. I think that's, that approach doesn't really apply with somebody who's actually starting off. So I, I, I think a lot of people who are successful on Amazon are successful on Amazon because their focus was very crystal clear what really they wanted to do. There were a lot of opportunities on Amazon earlier, which are actually winning away, which is arbitrage. You know, you are selling somebody else's on ASIN as a catalog. I mean, hustling, you know, I never hustled that way. I, I don't think it's a long-term strategy. But if you want to be on Amazon and you want to be successful, there, there are simple, basic things that you have to do. And that has never changed in the last hundreds of years as long as the commerce actually exists, right? I mean, first of all, you must have a product that somebody needs or somebody wants. So Amazon is not a product where you can come up with something fantastic and try to create a demand for it. So there are other platforms for those, right? I mean, those are product-driven companies. Like Tesla doesn't need it to be on Amazon because they created something unique, you know, so that's different. Amazon is a platform. Number one thing is critically important is that you want, to make, you want to make sure that this is something that people either need or they actually want, and you actually have a good amount of competition in the space. I like competition. It's, it's like you want to open a restaurant. You know, the chances of opening a restaurant in an area where there are other restaurants, your success actually goes up by 74%. You go open that restaurant in a boonies, you're gonna, you, you, you know, it's dead by 100 nights, right? I mean, that's what happens. So you want to have a competition. You don't want to have a hyper competition. And then I think what a mistake a lot of young entrepreneurs and a lot of young sellers do is they, they don't have enough differentiation either in their branding or, or either physically in their products. In my space, I, I compete with people who sell curtains at $9.99 or, or $4.99 or $8.99. And I know exactly what they're doing, what they're making for, what they're actually making out of it. I don't want to do that part because... Ultimately, the long-term success that comes along is, is when people get your product and in their heart, they know they've got worth the money that they've spent. And as long as your product is able to do that, you know, in terms of its quality, and, you know, I sell a thing that visually I can, you know, $5, $20, $100, $400 curtains are all going to look the same. 
but it, you know, it's when you get them, it's when you start to see the difference. You know, it's the fabric weight, it's the it's the drippability of the weight, it's the quality of the stitching, it's the quality of the side hems. You know, uh, it's quality of lining and all. You know, there's just a bunch of things. So everybody wants to. You want to make sure that your product that you're selling. It doesn't have to be unique, but it, it needs to be differentiated from other customers, or, uh, sorry, other competition of yours, that when somebody gets it, he actually appreciates what he or she is getting. you got to be, you got to differentiate yourself. And I think a lot of people don't do that. They get into this, you know, Alibaba model, you know, same supplier, same manufacturers, just a different color, right? you are not able to do that part. And I, I know many people, you know, I, I, I used to go to China twice, thrice a year, walking the Canton Fair, and I used to come across these young kids and they're just buying stuff and 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 they just don't realize, you know, you're buying thing that 25 people are buying also. So at the end of the day, you will have the same thing that 20 other people have. So what is the real difference that you are selling in men? And then unfortunately what becomes is, is the pricing, right? And, and now you are playing the pricing game. Your cost of acquisition because of the level of competition keeps on going up because you're bidding the same keywords or same search terms. And you are, on the other hand, your, your selling becomes on the price. So you're, comp you're, you're compressing your margins. And a lot of young people, or a lot of young entrepreneurs or even seasoned entrepreneurs, you know, they really don't understand how critical it is on Amazon specifically is to have a net margin business, you got to make money. It doesn't happen the first month. You can lose money for a year, which is fine. Every business can, as long as you can sustain it. I think a lot of people fail because they don't spend enough time, enough due diligence in truly charting out what it really requires to be successful on Amazon. And one of the thing is to be able to stay alive on Amazon for a long time and able to consistently deliver great products during that time at the price where you can actually walk away with some net margins. And, 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 and that's where things goes wrong. People buy this inventory, they drop the price, and then they run in negatives, they can't replenish on time, you know, they build the reviews, but there is no inventory, you know, or, 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 or they're taking too long, they lose their ranking. Now, so it, it's a cycle that you... You can do it once, but then you got to break out of it very, very quickly. So I think a lot of people fail to really, truly chart out exactly what it takes to be successful on Amazon. That makes sense. If you had to break down the specific factors, like just off the top of my head, when I think of your business, I think of number one timing, like with the whole e-commerce thing, you guys were super early. Obviously, Yahoo stores, mm -hmm. eBay, like overstock. A lot of people who are selling today have never considered selling on these platforms. Maybe not eBay because eBay is still around and it's still pretty sizable. Right. A lot of the platforms that you guys are on were no longer there. So you're super early. So obviously you built up some volume from that. And when you got into Amazon, you already had some volume, you already had some data on which SKUs worked, which ones don't. Mm -hmm. You guys could buy more inventory. You could be more competitive with prices because of like economies of, of scale, I'd assume at that level would start to maybe kick mm -hmm. in, maybe not like in a, a super meaningful way just because from your uh like description of things like the volume wasn't huge when you guys first launched on amazon but obviously you mm -hmm. guys did have a head start and even with amazon 2016 isn't super early like some people were listed two decades ago but still reasonably mm -hmm. early compared to most of the people who have tried to launch since COVID, right because most brands mm -hmm. these the ones that i got to meet have started within the last four years reasonably early to amazon uh, plus you also had the vendor relationship with Amazon, which I assume had pushed things, especially since you guys were early, so they're more incentivized to get things going for you. Is there anything else right. you think contributed, just like looking retrospectively uh, at like the last 20 years of running the company? Uh, the key point, the key contributing factors to the success? Yeah. Uh, you know, consistency. You know, over the years, I, I, I still have customers who have bought our curtains 20 years ago. Uh, you know, they, they, and they're still hanging and, uh, you know, we have maintained, you know, our buying cycle in my industry or in our industry is about four or five years. So we have almost 37% repeat customer rate in, in, within this sector, which is really large. So it's the consistency of, you know, keeping your quality at the same level for a very long period of time. Other factors is, you know, uh, 
being in marketing and being understanding, you know, I have always been trying to abreast of, of the of the trends. So since the uh, expansion of social media into our lives over the last eight, 10 years, and starting with Facebook, obviously, or maybe more, you know, I, I think we were very, I was, I really made a push on very early on, on really trying to figure out what is trending and what is coming up the trends. And, and where we were, we are able to differentiate ourselves is that, you know, within our space, you know, I want to make sure that we have the largest assortment of products out there to be able to provide something for everybody out there, right? We can't be too, we can't be everything to everybody, but within our space, you know, we have tried to say, okay, here are the top seven, eight, nine styles of homes that exist, and they will always exist. There are people who love modern and contemporary. And then there are people who just love rustic, and then there are people who just like traditional. And then there are people who just, you know, who are transitional. And then there are th these people who just swing between back and forth. Sometimes they go modern, sometimes they go rustic, in, you know, um, industrial look. So we were very early on in, in actually mapping out these key lifestyles. And then we were very aggressive on coming out with our product lines through working with a very systematic supply chain that we have set up across multiple countries with our in-house design department that we were able to refresh our collection at the at twice or thrice the speed of anybody else and, you know uh, we we always made sure that whatever is coming out new in our industry like many years ago digital printing was always there you know many years ago on the apparel side but it was not there in the home goods side you know, I, I, I was very early on, I, I worked with a company and, and, and tried to understand the digital printing on, on thicker fabrics. And we were very early on in incorporating that into our production runs. And, and, and here's the difference, right? I mean, if you want to go and print a regular fabric on cotton, let's say, you, want to, you have a design that you want to go print on a rotary basis or whatever it is, you know, the, if you go to a factory, they will want 5,000 meters or 8,000 meter runs in a design in order to give you the right cost. So what was happening was a lot of these companies were risking a lot of money on one design because they had to hit the MOQs to hit the target. So by switching the tech base in within our industry, you know, we were able to test a lot of designs. I, you know, I could go as low as 300 meters on a digital printer and actually launch a print, right? And, 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 and that's a beautiful thing because I can launch 20 designs and I can say, okay, what's selling, right? What is selling that I can put it into a larger production runs. So things like those were very critical for us initially to really get on to the, to become a really successful, right? Even today, if you go to our site, we have eight, 900 different kinds of curtains that we sell. If you go to anybody else, Pottery Barn, Restoration Hardware, CB2, they max out at 60, 70, 80 because they have to carry a lot of other stuff. So we, we differentiated ourselves within our space, within the assortment, uh, which does not, by the way, mean that, that is the model on Amazon. Amazon is a completely flipped model. It's more of a focused model. So if you want to be good on Amazon, please don't launch 800 different Asians and go, you'll go bankrupt very, very quickly. But those things, you know, allowed us to be successful on every platform. So when we started to sell, we were able to curate these ASINs, which we know do very, very good for the Amazon market. You know, by definition, we have a X type customer on Amazon that looks for functionality. He, he or she is looking for a particular ASP and he or she wants a particular style. And that can be just captured within a very small subset of products that we want to sell on Amazon. And you can keep it abreast one color, two colors, different sizes also. But then you have a very different customer that we have on, on Wayfair. You know, this, this person is more, you know, she's doing a house. She has just bought a house. She wants, she's buying a couch. She's buying, you know, a dining room and she's buying a living room chairs and she wants to match and cross match the curtains. So we have a very different customer on those sites and a very different assortment that does really well on them. So I think for us, it was the diversification within the channels and also within the product line that made us successful. Now, that's not the formula for, for many people on Amazon, you know, because you can sell anything on Amazon. So, you know, 
it's finding success within your niches and understanding what is going to trend and what people I, you know it really comes in with with experience right you you kind of you kind of develop this gut feel what's going to work what's not going to work right i mean i'm a very gutsy guy i i can look at the numbers all day long but if and even if it's saying to me this is the 90% probability but if in my gut i don't feel it i'm not going to pull the trigger on it and i've been wrong but i think i've been right more more than i've been wrong so i keep on doing the same thing over and over again and to a lot of entrepreneurs out there that's that's really the key but i, I think if you step back a little bit you know uh, you ask me what is what is a key thing i think passion in this space is really important a lot of people start on these side hustles and they will sell anything which they can think they can make money on and what happens is if you don't really love the niche that you are in or 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 the product that you're really selling you will you will never be able to pour your heart into it you will never go that extra mile to research that that category you never go an extra mile to figure out how can i make it better you know you will and that is an Achilles heel and that becomes one of the reasons why so many people fail because they get into this thing which they truly don't understand or it's not satisfaction right to me i have loved art all my life I, you know even if you see my room around i've you know i i i can show you around it i have a lot of artwork in my room like it's everywhere so i i love art and and to me fabric is an art right so so it was and it was in my inherently i love the cre- you know the creativity within the fabrics and designing though for 15 years i was doing right from internet to civil engineering work you know i never got into it but i always had that life so i i, I had a lot of passion and my wife is actually a textile designer by the way so she had a lot of passion into it so whatever you see as success like you have passion for data and you have passion for what you're doing and you're successful because you love the numbers you love you love the development in tech and i think a lot of people miss that side of the thing they never answer their inner sense what they really want to do you can sell anything on amazon but if your heart is right in it you will you will you will succeed i mean if, if even if you are doing coffee mugs with just a nice tagline on it but if you love pottery and you love how to do it you will be great but if you're just looking hey i can buy this from alibaba for one dollar and flip it for two bucks you know it's, it's going to be very short lived yeah yeah of course so you've spoken a bunch about the successes that you've had and like the smart decisions you made and how all of these contributed to where you are today but i also want to ask out some of the struggles because obviously you guys had a multi decade journey so far and you know you went through the financial crisis in 2008 but i'm sure outside of that like a bunch of things happened over the last couple of decades especially like even with me like you know i've been in business for less time than you guys and i obviously have seen the ups and downs myself oh absolutely um uh, yeah lots of challenges right i i mean uh, there was uh, scaling a business uh from a uh bootstrap operation is is never easy right so one of the biggest challenges that i had to overcome myself was was mm-hmm. initially uh making myself numb to the risk right and and by uh by which i mean is this one second i just need to get this one okay uh it, it, it was it, it it was to me that was a huge challenge right so i would very i was very risk averse for a very long time and i think that actually hurt the growth of the company for many years uh you know i i used to overthink my purchases i used to overthink my uh, uh my number of sku's i want to carry and and the sizes i want to carry you know i shot myself um, hundreds of times in my foot by bringing out a winner putting my effort into it and making it a winner and then boom out of the inventory for 3 months because what my biggest challenge was we make everything outside us right so it's it's india pakistan china those are three major countries that we we actually operate in fabric is not something that is can be done very quickly unlike many other things can be it's not a just in time inventory product you know if you have a special product that is running you know sometimes you have to weave the product right and then you know so you're weaving from the yarn you are dyeing it then you're printing it and then you're making it and then there is a 
inbound shipping time and receiving. And one of the biggest challenges that we had for a very, very long time was to overcome the supply chain, uh, supply chain challenges. And that only got better for us when I uh, realized many years ago that I am my own biggest enemy. And then I went and hired a guy and, and a team of people to do a deeper analysis and run the data in a different sense and 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 start taking over those things. And and it, also the challenge of overcoming your, you know, being a small business back then and then trying to, you know, you're borrowing money from the bank and then you want to make sure that you want to do the right thing. I think that was a huge challenge for us. And technically, it was streamlining the supply chain part of it. So for me personally, it was just becoming less risk averse and try to say, okay, it is what it is and then get used to it. If it doesn't sell, there are ways to sell it. Uh, and that actually really, really hurt my growth for many, many years because we used to be out of stock a lot. You know, we would have our winners and we put a lot of effort into it and marketing and this and that. And and then it's gone for three months and by the time when it comes again, that the trend was gone or, or then you're again starting from the bottom and then you're going up. On the flip side, you know, you can never be 100% stocked and you should never be 100% stocked because that's a theory you can't really do. But the balance is really important, right? Uh, so that challenge was overcome by, first of all, giving out that thing to a better somebody who was much better than me in, in, in figuring these things out and giving them the authority and making the decision making and, and, and also taking the larger risk, uh, which actually worked better for us because now that we are a multi-channel sales company, which I recommend to most people, they should always have multiple channels to sell. Uh, I don't believe in just being a, an omni-channel seller. Uh, you know, it's a strategy which can work, but if you are a, if you're at our level, you know, we're cutting a lot of inventory. It's good to have multiple channels because you can mitigate a lot of risk. So that was one of the one of the major challenges. Uh, fulfillment was a huge challenge. Uh, you know, we I never outsourced my fulfillment, and, and I never outsourced our fulfillment because. In our industry, it's really important to make sure that the customer gets what he wants. And by that example, I can tell you that what it is. If I have a red velvet curtain, and let's say I have a stock that was produced in March, and then I have a product stock that was produced in September, by every technical means, those two dialogues of the colors are never going to match. If you really put them side by side, there'll be a slight difference in them. And because of, you know, dyeing is something which is controlled by a lot of factors. It's obviously dyes can be controlled. The formulas can be are, are controlled. It's the temperature and the humidity, right? In the season that you're actually reviewing and, and fabric reacts very differently. I heard it, learned it very hard way. So we had to make sure that we don't mix the dialogues to our customers. I, I, I can't have you pull one from March and one from June and put it together. There will be two different colors when you get it. So that was a huge challenge, right? Uh, fulfillment challenges. So that took a lot out of us. And especially when we uh, relocated our warehousing to Atlanta, Georgia, you know, I had to go spend months and months over there with the team and work with them and train them, introduce dialog systems, WMS systems to make sure that at least 95% of our customers get the same dialogues that they're ordering from. Sometimes people want eight curtains and we want to make sure there's all those eight of them are the same color. This doesn't happen in, in, in apparel because you never buy or very rarely you would buy eight same color t-shirts. But in this particular space, it, it's, 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 a, it's a make or break because that then initiates dissatisfaction. It, it initiates a bad review. It, it initiates a return and all the costs. So that was a huge challenge. It is still a challenge. We have ways to mitigate it. You know, we do swatching. We do a lot of innovative way to uh, tell customers we, you know, that was one, that was one challenge. The other challenge that we face and still we face actually, and I think everybody in our space faces is the product that we sell it reacts very differently in different lighting conditions. You know, if I hang something on the wall and I have a fluorescent light and I have a green curtain, it's going to look very different green versus a 
non-fluorescent light. It will look very different in a day when the sun is baking from the back versus the sun is coming from the front. So one of the biggest challenges that we have to date is, and you have actually helped us a lot in, in that category is doing our PDPs, is how do we make sure that customer makes a very informed decision? Because all we can do is we can really need to inform customers, okay, look, you are buying a brown velvet, but the same brown velvet can actually look light brown or a light green in the lighting condition you're going to see it. Yes, we can. We sell swatches on our site. People can get that and try it out, a small piece of fabric. But that's a big challenge that we need, need to overcome. And we continuously try to find ways, whether it is working through AI Hello and making fantastic PDPs and, and putting them up uh, or capturing the curtains in, in, in you know, in different lights. So, so it's a lot of work. And, and, and that was a challenge that, you know, which actually required us to establish our own in-house studio. Uh, 10,000 square foot studio with my own photographers and videographers and all that. And we actually, it's, people just don't realize actually, and, and I wish I could walk through our customers through the process. It takes a lot for anybody to make a proper good Amazon or any other listing. It, it, you know, it takes blood and sweat and you've got to put it together, you know. So it's a lot of appreciation that needs to happen on the, on the fantastic e-commerce sites. Shoes and all those are really easy to shoot because... You know, a lot of products you can put into a light box and you can get them. But when you get into these products where you are actually selling lifestyle items and people perceive them in a particular zone in their home and they want something else. So it's, it's, it's a challenge that we do. Apart from them, uh, work-life balance was a huge challenge. You know, I was a workaholic. I remember years that I put in 17, 18 hours a day. I was doing my own Amazon PPC. I was doing my own eBay listings. I was doing my own Yahoo uh, listings that were providing customer service late at night, you know, so those were the initial days uh, that made me through go through all the processes. I think first four or five years, I think I must have worked at least 16, 17 hours a day and then I had kids and then balancing. Uh, but hey, uh, my advice to everybody is, and you are not married, and if you are, then if you get there, you know, do spend time with your kids. I think that's the best best time in your life, right? I, I did miss it out on my eldest one, who was not able to spend a lot of time with him, but I, I did uh, learn from that. And then I do spend time with my daughter a lot. And then with, with my youngest one right now, you know, I'm very actively involved. So that's the takeaway. That was a big challenge, keeping the balance in your business and your priority, right? I mean, you know, it, those are a few of the challenges. Yeah, I mean, I don't necessarily think you could be successful anyway if you have balance in the early years like if you're doing like a six hour work day and you're at stage zero like it's very difficult to get off the ground like even to this day i just shared this with someone on my team actually my average sleep hours like per day average time in bed i think is what it's called on the application yeah, right like three four hours a day i think average yeah. hour or i think i don't even know what the time period is like last year or last 12 months something like that is three hours and seven minutes a day uh, is my average yep. time spent to sleep. So I don't think like if someone's in this thinking like, Hey, I'm going to work for four hours a day and I'm going to make a bunch of money and I'll, you know, live this laptop lifestyle. And I'll quit my job because my job's eight hours. I don't want to do eight hours. Let me do four hours a day selling on Amazon. Like it's generally not going to work. Like some people do it. No, make, like a few grand a month in profit, but it's still not. Working. I have never, I have never come across. I, I live in Silicon Valley. Yeah. Uh, blessed to be here because I do have very successful friends and as many success stories I've seen uh, a read and actually firsthand know of people it takes a lot it, it it requires dedication it requires persistence and it requires you to fail because I think failure is the best teacher in life because unless you don't fail you don't actually understand what you know you don't, you, you really don't get it. And, you know, it's a common thing, you know, uh, a sound like thing, but you know, it, it's, it actually teaches you a lot of things. I've failed a lot. I've, I have had busted designs. I have uh, gone semi bankrupt, so, you know, a few times in my in thing where I bought a wrong stuff or I bought a, a pen on a wrong thing. But you know, what you don't do is you, you try to learn from the mistakes and try not to repeat it. And, and, and being consistent and persistent and resilience, I think as long as you have those three things, uh, you will be successful. And I, I think one of the other things that 
for young entrepreneurs and young kids uh, out there anywhere in the world, you know, you got to believe in yourself, right? And and, and you got to believe in yourself that you you can do this thing. And and with that, as I said, my challenge was trying to do everything myself. It can generally work in the first couple of years, but I I think biggest thing is always surround yourself with people who know more than you and and try to learn from them and if you have the opportunity of working with any one of them who knows one part of the deal better take that work you know just don't push your own thinking process and say okay, i am right and i know everything and I, I think i did that a lot you know as a, that was my challenge i thought i could do it all and and you know hard way you learn you can't and and that's the biggest takeaway in my life is you know always have people who know th- things better than you you know i no basic Amazon advertising. There's no way I can run an Amazon ad right now. I don't understand. I don't want to understand. I just want to find people like Seth who, who knows it deep inside and go man, and have it happen. And, and that's really critical. You know, uh, I, I, I've i taken this thing. I'm, I'm trying to be on a voice on LinkedIn when I'm trying to teach people, look, stay away from all these agencies who are making so much noise out there. Man, I just posted an article today. Mm-hmm. I keep on getting these feeds, right? I mean, if an, if an Amazon agency is spending 90% of their time in marketing themselves on LinkedIn, you know, something is really wrong because they're losing 80% of their customers every month. You know, your work should speak for yourself. You know, you can read my post on the on the LinkedIn. I just did but before the call I was sitting and getting, so I got, I'll, I'll write something on it. But yeah. you've got to believe in yourself. That's true. All of you and, and, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No. And the due diligence, right? I mean, I mean, do your due diligence. I, I think a lot of people need to have a gut check. Business is not for everybody. And it's a gut check that everybody needs to have, yeah, right? Uh, because there are many people. I mean, I, I have friends who have a lot more money than I have or successful than I have. They can't do business. They can do a great job at Google or at Network Appliances or at Amazon AWS, and make a ton of money, or at, or you know, or at Nvidia, but they can't do a business. They just, they just are not, the, you know, their their DNA is not business. So I think that's the one question that people need to understand: Am I suited for a business, whatever business size it is? It's hundred million or it's four hundred thousand dollars. Can you go through the highs and lows? You know, are you comfortable with those? With those ebbs and flows, can you absorb the pressure? Can you can you, can you actually go through those sleepless nights? Can you go and see your, you know you don't have money in the bank and then you got to go borrow money and then put it back in the business and run and and then hope it sells? And I, I think those are the big questions for Amazon sellers because uh, we are talking specifically Amazon here because it's an inventory driven business. It's not a business. It's you're not selling a SaaS application. It's not like your business, right? Though you have your own risk. The risk that you carry in an inventory business is very different than any other business. It's not a service business. So if you want to go into this business where you want to buy and you want to sell and you want to have a great product, you must sit down and question yourself. First of all, why do I want to do that? Is there a better thing I can do and make more money than doing this? If the answer is, I love my product, I love this space and I want to do this thing, is then the second thing comes down is, can you go through the ups and flows? Do you understand really what it takes? You know, there's a very different thing when Nike decides to sell on Amazon and then pull it back and then go back on Amazon. That's very different. Then a guy, you know, was making $75,000 a year sitting in, let's say, Milwaukee and he wants to go and sell on Amazon. Great. Love it. You know, is do you have the things and do you understand the map and you've charted out the risk chart and you say, okay, I can take it. I can go and do it. And if I lose, I will learn a lot and that's fine. Please go ahead and do it. You know, no issue with that. But it's something that a lot of young people, even very established people, they leave their jobs and go on Amazon. And then I, I, I personally have come across maybe 10, 20 people who have not you know, were busted their life savings, and, and you know, they're still sitting on inventory in their in their garages, and it's just because you know they couldn't really understand what was really happening out there. Yeah, and I think one of the benefits of being young is you don't really have as much to lose. Like obviously, you know, once you're married, then you have kids, 
maybe you're used to making a certain amount, like it's more difficult. But if you start super young, like I started, I was still in primary school. Uh, like, I said, like, like I had nothing, like if I lost everything back then, it wouldn't matter. Like I didn't have a mortgage to pay and have any loans. Oh. So if, you, if you're 100%. young, you have much to lose. Like, Oh, well, when you are young and you can lose it all, I actually recommend lose it all a few times. It's okay. Because, yeah. uh, I mean, you know, my son is doing his, you know, he just started his own uh, basketball thing. And I'm not funny. I, I funded the basic part of it for a while. And that's about it. You know, and I told him, hey, you know, this is better than going to Harvard and getting your MBA. You know, if you lose this business, it's okay. You will still walk away with something which is, you would never have, would have learned into any school. You know, you would never have learned the things that you learned. So it's fantastic. I mean, I, I encourage every young entrepreneur who wants to be in this space and wants to do something. Yes, the best time to do it is when you're young, when you can lose everything and you can start back again. Because at the end of the day, if you try to build a business on Amazon and you failed, and I promise to you in your resume, if you only write this thing, I did this on Amazon and I failed, but I've learned the following things. P.S., whatever your name is, you will get an interview <laughs> because nobody, everybody highlights their, their successes, right? This is a, failing to do this thing. And failing after doing it right, and just by, you know, you could just be wrong. You, you could just be, you mistimed your product. You know, you might just, some XYZ seller c comes in and knocks your price off by 50% and you, you sold, but you did not make margin. And you said, okay, I can't do, I can't compete with them and I failed. But if you actually take that failure and translate that into what you have learned from that failure and you put that out there, you know, that is success in, in my opinion. So that is something that everyone needs to taste. I, I, I think it is the best education that you get out of it. But the, you know, the bracket is that you got to do it right. So, you, you know, it's garbage in, garbage out. You know, there, there are many reasons to fail. You can have the best product. You can have the best PPC, great branding. And somebody can come up and sell the same thing for 50% price and you can't compete. And it's not your fault. It just happened. That's the industry. That's what trade is about, and it is what it is. So if if you and and you lose money because of that, it's not your fault. But if you if you figure out what you've learned in all those cycles and everything else, that's phenomenal. I mean, I think what Amazon business can teach you uh, is 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 outstanding, right? I mean, from apart from product development and all of that, I, th I think you get a basic form of education in finances, right? I mean, you understand how to keep your books. You you understand the fundamental of of, of numbers, right? What is P and L? You you actually get it, and that because your life has a P and L. At the end of the day, when you die, it's not about your money, right? I mean, there are two sides to your life. I mean, either you you die in a loss or you die in a profit. The profit is the time that you actually had, and you had an amazing journey, right? I mean, that's and you have no regrets, and that's the profit. So you learn that part in Amazon. You know, you you learn in any business. You go through. You you, you make your foundation. You you have a you you get the insight into fulfillment side of the business, which is logistics. You understand actually how logistics works, and you get to expose to so many things which you wouldn't you know you might never even thought about it. Like I mean, things like can I repackage this thing in a different way where I can reduce an inch from the packaging and I can save forty five cents in Amazon FBA fees. You know, <laughs> you learn a lot, and then you can apply those things in so many places. So. It's it's an amazing experience, and I learned. I serve on I learn every day something new about business. Every day something about Amazon, and I have my running notes. I keep it up. I mean, I've chatted with you. I've learned so much, especially in the last call that I had with you about PPC, and all. it was fantastic. So it's a learning ground, and you're right. Timing is the earlier you are, the better it is because you can absorb the risk, and you can learn from it, you can redo it again. I know people who have failed one product, two product, and the third time is a charm. They hit it right, right? So, resilience. Yeah, the rising tide obviously lifts all boats. Like it's a lot easier to keep growing your business if like online sales for your category are going like 20% right. year or more probably if you were that early. Probably online uh, sales for like soft fabrics in the home and goods like category is probably growing at a crazy percent every single year. Uh -huh. 
So obviously that kind of raises everyone in that business. Not all of them last, and that goes back to your operations and how you manage your business. But obviously starting mm -hmm. then does put you at an advantage. But you've had a very interesting journey so far, and we had a call about this and about what you have planned next. And I think it's super exciting. And obviously, as I shared on our call, it's something that's important for me personally. So it would be great if you could share yeah. that. Sure. So for a very long point of time, I, I do travel a lot back and forth. Um, I'm originally from Pakistan, you know that. And there, there's a lot of struggle out there. You know, uh, life is hard. Eco economy is hard. Uh, super talented people, super talented guys. And in the industry I am in, I have a good setup back home, a small factory. So I come across a lot of artisans of different kinds. So one of the last years, one of the things that I, because my involvement in half price grapes is, is coming down to a just product development. Actually, I've, as I said, I've uh, delegated a lot of daily work to a lot of people and I'm trying to get out of it. Uh, is, you know, I've, if you have set up a separate organization, a business uh, it's called Peak Broad Ventures, and under that, uh, in the upcoming year in January, uh, we're already doing a trial product. Um, a trial uh, project is in place. Is we decided to address a need of not only a VC but rather a, a you know a, a venture partner. And by that, I, what I mean is, I saw a big gap between these small, fantastic manufacturers who are artisans or are just manufacturers and they have no idea about e-commerce and they're struggling and they can produce so much and they can do something, but whatever they produce is, is phenomenal. They understand production, they understand product development. They have no idea about the e-commerce space. They have no idea what to do with it and they're sitting idle, nor they have the funding, nor they have the money, and nor they have the resources or the knowledge to bring it out in the, you know, on a global space. So we formed a company called Peak Broad Ventures, which will be formally launched in January in Pakistan uh, with the road tour in three cities. And, and the goal is to work with small enterprises, whether it's on an individual level or a very small level, and within the given spaces, which we also understand. So what we are doing is we are running a very deep data analysis on the categories and then we are overlaying that data with the manufacturing capacity base within pakistan that's where i'm starting off with hopefully i can take it to egypt and i can take it to other places and we can replicate the thing and the model so we're taking what is produced in that subset of the country and what the market for those things are and is there any product opportunity? So then we identify those opportunities, then we're gonna go and we find these manufacturers who fit the profile, who the only requirement we have are two for, that you know production really well, and you can scale to X level, and you can control the quality throughout the whole process. You know, if you match that KPI and you are in that spec, then Big Broad Ventures, which is my own personal money, you know, we're going to put it in your in the business together. We're going to launch a brand on Amazon, on Etsy, wherever it needs to be, based on the product. And we're going to build the brand, and at some point of time, we're going to sell the brand. And then, when we sell the brand, that artisan, that that you know, that guy has an ownership in the brand also. So he will also take. That part. I mean, it doesn't matter whatever money it is. You know, money in Pakistan is 280 times more than what it is here. So if you if you are able to sell a brand in three years for let's say half a million dollars, you will, as being a partner, you will walk away with 125 thousand plus the supply chain. So, so we have nailed down that part. You know, our first beta project is launching, and you will actually know about it in a few days. Uh, it's in the leather space. It's called Bevan and All. That brand will be launched on Amazon very really shortly. Uh, it's a leather product, right? It's a very small, highly curated hand products, you know, laptop sleeves and some bags and stuff like that. But everything is handmade, top class leather, world class products item. You can compare to all the top brands you want to compare to. So we're bringing that out and working with one family of artisans, that, you know, that I chose that does everything proper you know their shop is beautiful their dyeing is amazing and their stitching is world-class 
So that's that's my first product. And then we're gonna find the other ones. So so with those guys, the deal was such. Hey, would you work with us? Okay, yes, sir, I will work with you. Okay. What is the cost of the material? So we broke it down and we funded the cost of the product. What is the cost of the labor? So we funded the cost of the labor also. So from day one, the manufacturer gets paid for the cost of the goods and the cost of the labor, not the profit. So we, we then pick up the goods on our expense. We bring it here and we're going to market it along with you. Obviously, that's, you know, that's a missing part of it. And try to make a brand out of it. The goal is we launch 10 of those over the time. And, you know, if three or four are successful, you know, amazing. But these are the people that actually don't understand the space really well. Uh, and they don't know how to do with it. And, and again, there are a lot of costs involved. You know that in launching a product, right? So I'm starting off in Pakistan because I have a good team over there. So we can do a lot of work over there. We can do all the FPA uh, uh, qualified shipping packaging in Pakistan. We can label it correctly. We can do the UPC codes rightly. We can produce all the content over there, right? I mean, it's cost-effective way of doing it. I have a 10,000 square foot studio. We can shoot the products. We can read the products. We, can, we have a team of guys who are getting trained from your team, actually, on, on some, of, some of the data points. And work together. And that's, it's on me, it's not about money, it's about personal satisfaction. You know, if I can, if in four or five years, if I have two or three great success stories, I, I, I think I would have achieved what I really wanted to achieve. And uh, it's a beautiful thing. I've got a fantastic response. And I've, I've been invited to this exhibition in mid October in Islamabad, where over uh, 1,500 vendors are coming in, and I've got to be pre qualified. I have about 400 vendors. Out of them, they have to meet in in the next period of one month, and they they are from various industries. Some are in apparel industry. Some are they make pottery. Some make small furniture. Some make other scarves, and you know all kind of stuff. Uh, what what we don't want to do is we don't want to give anybody a false hope. So we are doing our uh, groundwork up front. So we we when we talk to a vendor, we actually give them a absolutely clear picture of what the cost of the product needs to be fob and landed what is the cost of full you know associated to sell that product and what the margins are going to be you know people have this this understanding you're going to make 100 percent markups now you know if you're making 15 20 percent net margin 15 percent net margin on amazon you're doing very very good so you know, that's the project that we're doing, and uh, I'm sure you will learn more about you, and I, I'm i going to invite you with me to Pakistan to want to do the roadshow. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to come. If I'm like a guy in Pakistan and I'm, you know, doing manufacturing and I fit the criteria that I outlined, is there a place I have to go? Is there a place I could reach out? Like, what does that process look like? The process is going to be, the Peak Broad Venture website is going to be launched in November, uh, sorry, in end of October, and then there will be an application process over there. And then uh, I put together a team of people on the ground. I have about six people who will actually go and visit your facility. They're going to meet you and they're going to walk you through it. We're going to catalog your products and then it's going to come down to the, the, to the team and then it's going to go to the analysis teams. And then uh, if the analysis team gets okay, the product quality team says it's okay, the costings are okay, then... It's going to be a one-on-one -on -one meeting in our office. If you are in Lahore, I'll fly you to Karachi. Or we'll go to Karachi, Lahore, whatever it is. It's one-on-one -on -one meeting. That's how we did it with this one. I'm working with a kid uh, in Lahore right now, and I'm in Karachi. So we went there three, four times, and you know we have done the development product. And actually, I will send you one. Give me your address in Canada. I'll, I'll mail you one. You would love it. It's just an outstanding product. And, 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 and that's the thing, right? And so, yes, there will be an on-ground team within Pakistan which will work with you on a one-to-one -one basis. There's a lot of red flags and, you know, we, we, we don't want to do that part. We don't, and again, the onboarding process is going to be very selective, unfortunately, because uh, the funding is going to be tight, uh, you know, and we want to make sure that the most uh, merited guy gets the thing, right? I mean, we're going to fund maybe two or three companies next year at the most because it takes a lot of work to get them going on. So be part, you know, picking them up on that level, uh, it's going to be uh, very selective. But on the other side, I do intend to also open up the, the, the advisory space. So for the mid-tier or smaller companies who are already doing business online and they want help 
you know, that is something that we will also provide through that thing. You know, we'll venture with them as partner. So whether, if it's bringing you or AILO as a tool to run their, uh, you know, the, the PPC management, whether it's my team in Karachi to do the production shoots or videos, you know, we will provide those services separately at a very discounted rate because I really want to help these companies really get off the ground. So, so there'll be two elements of it. First is obviously where we will put in our own money in, in the brands and, and actually bring them out here. A lot of people don't understand, you know, they, you know, I, I know this guy, I want a trademark on Amazon, you know, and I want to be in five classes. You know, I don't have the number for him. I say, you know what? It's going to cost you $2,800. He said, what? $2,800? I say, yeah, man. Every class is three fifty, right? So when you're doing this business, people don't understand that, you know, there's cost that comes into play. And when you don't have the money, you know, you say three fifty is a lot of money for a lot of people in Pakistan. It's almost 80, 90,000 rupees. So if you want to, if you want to, if, if you have a product that can sell in three different classes, you want, you know, and you want to do a trademark, it's going to cost you $1,000. So a lot of people back off from there. And then they don't protect their listings. Then their brand gets hijacked. Then the listings, you know, somebody else comes on the point. So a lot of education needs to be done. I, I think, and, and I think that's one of my passion is to really work with these kids and really teach them. You know, I, whenever I go to Pakistan, if I have an opportunity, you know, Sometimes I get invited to some of the MBA programs and I do, I do go out there, I do give them speeches and talk about, you know, general motivation. But the thing is, you want to give, there are very, very few people out there who would give you a clean advice who have actually made a lot of money on Amazon and lost a lot of money on Amazon. You know, I, I see these agencies on every media channel, promising you the moon and the sun and, and it, 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 it I'm, I'm sure many people fall for them and then nothing happens you know so that's another ambition of mine is to make sure that I, can, I become our company becomes you know one of the hubs of providing clean clear honest information whether you use our services or don't use our services I damn care as long as you understand what it really takes so education to entrepreneurship is going to be one of my personal goals that I would like to initiate. Um, I think that might happen in the second part of the year. Uh, but in January, Peak Broad Ventures will be officially introduced in Pakistan in three cities. Um, you know, we're going to go and do a roadshow in Karachi, Lahore, Sialkot, and Festabad, the four major production zones. And we want to pick up three companies in three different spaces. So uh, one is in pottery, one is something new in sporting goods, you know, and the other one is going to be in, in some sort of textiles, but not home textiles. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Well, we've shared a lot of, or you've shared, to be more accurate, a lot of good insights on this episode. Uh, I just want to finish it off with some advice from you to all of the maybe young people who are already entrepreneurs or are thinking of taking the dive especially those from like countries like Pakistan, where you came from, or Egypt, where I came from, or other similar lower income, lower opportunity countries. Like, obviously, it's yeah. tough for other people out there. You know, incomes are low. It's very hard to get startup capital. Very hard to take a loan, like we were talking on our previous call. 30% interest yeah. rates are normal in these countries. What, what advice can you give to these guys? Uh, I think one of the... First advice I have is don't be afraid of dreaming big, okay? But while you dream big, you need to stay grounded. You need to stay grounded and you need to understand the realities of the market. You need to understand the unique challenges and the opportunities in the environment you actually work with. And other is to leverage the resources that are available to you. You know, learn from people who know a little bit of things. If you know somebody who understands a little bit of Amazon, try to understand them. If you know somebody who knows a little bit about web development, learn from it. So it's really important to really understand, you know, how to leverage your resources. And the most important one is to stay persistent. You know, success uh, doesn't happen overnight. You know, uh, it comes with dedication. It comes with resilience and it comes with willingness to learn and to achieve great things. I, I mean, I think those are the simple my advice to everybody in this entrepreneur is, you know, you got to dream big. You, you got to think you can be next job, um, you know, Jama or whatever that is, or, or Elon Musk or, or, you know, you, you can, there's no harm in dreaming, you know, uh, 
because if you don't have ever dream big, you're never even going to do the first thing that actually you need to do. And and when people, but just don't dream, right? You you need to understand your your framework. You need to understand your, uh, you know, you need to understand what you really need to do, and understand what your environment is. Understand how much risk can you take, and what can you really do, and then you stay true to yourself, and you stay persistence. You you know, you want to be consistent. Don't be afraid of the failures. Fall down, get back, run again, and and keep on waiting. I, I think that's um, that's really what it takes to to succeed in life in general. Whether you are doing a job, or you're doing a career, or you want to be a great father, you just you know you just want to be out there doing those few things correctly. That's that's my humble advice at this point. Yeah, and I do agree on the dream big thing. Like especially from these countries, you see a lot of guys or girls who start out that they're like, hey, if I can do this freelance thing and make a few hundred dollars a month, like I'll be happy. Even with myself, like when I started making money online, because I made some money offline before that, when I started making money online, I'd freelance content writing and I'd make half a dollar an hour. And I only had yeah. like two hours of work to do per day. I'd make like a dollar, a dollar and a half per day. And I was a kid and I didn't like need to pay for anything. I had no bills back then. So it was whatever. But like I realized later on that you could just decide to do something way bigger. And it's equally as hard. Like it's equally as hard to like have a SaaS product and have a managed service and, you know, work with thousands of Amazon brands as it was to like just spam people to try to sell them freelance copywriting for half a dollar an hour. Like I'm not doing. Oh, yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Seth. And I, I, I think one of the things that, you know, people tie their dreams to monetary gains. And I, I think that's a mistake that, you know, a lot of people make. I want to make X amount of money. Don't worry about that part. You know, try to, you know, it, it's really, you know, success is not about seizing an opportunity. In my opinion, you know, I could be wrong. Success is about creating an opportunity which doesn't exist for you. It might exist. I think that's the true, you know, that's the true success. You know, when you create an opportunity for you, which never existed. So as you said, a guy sitting in Pakistan, if he can create or in Egypt can make $200 a month or $300 a month. People just don't know. $300 a month in Pakistan is above high monthly income. When you work 30 days a week in, in, in a corporate company, that's what you make, $400 at the max. That's a median income for an educated guy. So if you can make that money, and that opportunity never existed, right? You, 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 and you create that opportunity for yourself. That's what it is. It's not about just seizing an opportunity. Yeah, I can sell this. No, it's not about finding what opportunity doesn't exist for you and then create that one. And then nurturing that opportunity with resilience, you know, and then expanding that with the commitment to excellence. I think if you can just do that, I think you'll be fantastically successful. People who chase money, money runs away from them. People who just chase their passion, money just follows them. And that's just what I've seen. And money is a very small part of it. You know, it is an important part of our lives. It, you know, it solves a lot of problems. But it's not, it's not the ultimate satisfaction that you actually feel great about it. I know a lot of people with a lot of money on 25 drugs. So, it, you know, it is what it is. I think, I think that my last part is, you know, I've tried to capture it as much as I can. Yeah, no, this was great. There was like a ton of value because sometimes like you speak to people, you know, to try to film a podcast episode, they have like, very general, very surface level advice. And, you know, the story is not that great, you know, but you obviously have like a story of doing stuff in entrepreneurship for two decades, e-commerce for two decades, which is very rare because e-commerce is not much older than that. You know, obviously some companies started before that, but the actual takeoff wasn't more than two decades ago. So this is like a start to finish like e-commerce journey that I personally found super interesting and all of the little details of manufacturing and all that other stuff. because. The truth is like it takes off more than just like good PPC or good product detail pages. Like it is an actual business and you do have to think like an actual business person to make the correct decisions and grow the company. Right. And PPC, like Amazon PPC was only a major part of the business recently. Like if you look at, you know, Overstock, uh, Wayfair, like yeah. all of these other platforms, like it wasn't like that back then, especially. So no, super interesting. Thank you so much for coming on. And I am super excited to release this episode. No, thank you very much for having me. It was fantastic to, first of all, it's amazing to know you as a person, uh, you know, what you have done, what you have built. And I, I wish AI Hello the best of success. 
And for people out there, you know, it's not a, just a personal recommendation. Uh, you know, the, I have been through multiple companies and hundreds of various agencies over the last 20 years. And, and I can tell you something, and, and this is not because I'm on your podcast, and this is an honest out of the heart opinion, the amount of attention and care that I have uh, my team and I personally experienced with AI Hello is, is remarkable. So I, I, I would say if anybody who was on Amazon already um, or is considering, you know, being on Amazon and, you know, if you guys really want to succeed, uh, you know, you must talk to Seth. At least, you know, regardless if you give him business or not, he's going to give you the right advice. And that's where I would leave it for you. You know, that's an honest, that's, that, that is just an honest opinion. I, I felt fantastic working with you. I've never met you actually, but I look forward to seeing you in San Francisco. But uh, it's been an honor working with you. And, and, and at your age, what you've done is remarkable. And all of my best wishes. And for all the young people, if Saf can do it, if I, an old man, can do it, you guys can do it. I really appreciate that. Thank you for coming on. Okay. Take care.